Let me show you this candle experiment that's kind of trippy, kind of cool, and then I'll give you more information about it than you probably ever wanted to know, but it'll give you a lot to think about it, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Let's get started. We're gonna get a spill. We're gonna light our candle and then cover it with a few different containers. Classically, this experiment's done covering the candle with something like this. But we'll see we can get a different result if we cover the candle with something like this. And then to make it a little more fun, I got a couple other containers. We can do this one on steroids or we could do it even smaller. So we'll see how those mess with our results. Which type of container do you think is gonna be more interesting when we cover our candle? The flask or the beaker? Let me know in the comments. Let's start with putting a couple drops of green dye in our water, just so we can see it a little more clearly. Let's do the classic first. Before we cover the candle, let's think about what's going on. Our candle flame ranges from about 800 to 1200 degrees Celsius. So that means it's really heating up the air molecules in this region here. And since they're heated, they're gonna be moving faster and that's gonna decrease the density of air in this area. And when you move this beaker over the top, it's gonna heat up air molecules inside here. So let's check it out and see what happens. It's probably hard for you to see, but originally all the water is pushed out so it's below, it's at the bottom of the beaker level. And then our flame slowly goes out and now we start to see the water level. It's rising up back to the level of the water on the outside, whereas before the water inside was actually below. So the water level on the inside now has gone from being lower than the outside back up to about even. So something happened on the inside that made it so the pressure decreased and then the water level rose back up and decreasing the air volume increased the pressure so that it matched the outside pressure once again. So why did that happen? So there's a couple really interesting papers that I'm gonna link in the comments that you might wanna check out. One of them is by a Harvard professor named Oliver Neal, or Knill, I'm not quite sure, I'm, I'm assuming Neal. Um, he teaches Harvard math and he's got a really fun blog on this that you might want to check out. And the second paper I'm going to link is by Harkurs Dinsat. Probably butchered your name and I'm really sorry about that. But he teaches math over at the department of Brunei at Dar es Salaam. So that's kind of like uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Philippines area right over there. So what just happened? Let me relight it and we'll talk through a few things. It's chemistry and physics. The first thing we already mentioned is that the molecules speed up because of the heat. That's gonna decrease the density. The second thing that's happening is the chemistry of the paraffin wax combustion. Paraffin's chemical formula looks kinda of like this. So it's whatever amount of carbons and then twice that many hydrogens plus two. So as our paraffin burns, it's consuming oxygen and in the process it's putting off carbon dioxide. And that reaction looks like this. Let me simplify it so it's kind of like methane was burning and it's a little easier to see what's happening. So it looks a little bit like this, where we have our carbon compound, in this case it's the wax, the paraffin, reacting with oxygen to produce CO2, which is a gas, and H2O, which starts out as a gas. So why is that important? The gas molecules are gonna be the ones that contribute to pressure inside of our jar. That means before the reaction happens, we have two gas molecules contributing to pressure. And then after, we have three gas molecules contributing to pressure. What the math professor from Brunei found was that we have about 30% difference. We have about 30% more gas molecules after the reaction happens, which should increase the pressure. 30% plus. But increasing the pressure would mean that air left but we saw water go in, which means the pressure actually decreased. So why does the chemistry help us understand that the pressure decreased? The water here started out as a gas, but then it condensed into a liquid. And once it's a liquid, it doesn't really contribute to the pressure. We go from two gas molecules before it's covered to one gas molecule after it's covered, once the reaction's all done. And that means we have less gas molecules after the situation's all finished in the products, which decreases the pressure. But what amount of oxygen do you actually need in order for combustion to be sustained? Well, the air all around us is made up of about 78% nitrogen, which is not gonna burn. Um, is there a way to make nitrogen burn? I don't know. 
Normally, nitrogen is not gonna burn, and the oxygen that we saw right there only accounts for about 21% of what we think of as air. So this is about 21% of what we think of as air, whereas most of what we think of as air is actually nitrogen, which is that 78%. Our candle's about to go out. Let me get another one. So what do those air concentrations mean in terms of our beaker? About 78% of the air inside of our beaker is gonna be nitrogen, and about 21% is gonna be oxygen. So you might think that the oxygen that's getting consumed in that reaction, right there, that 21%, that that is the 21% that rose inside of the beaker. But that would be kind of incorrect reasoning because in order for combustion to happen, the flame can only go to about 16% according to Smokey the Bear on the National Forest Service website, whatever it's called. National Park Service website. So that means you can go from 21% to 16%, which is only a 5% change, right? Four, five, yeah. So a 5% change of that 20% doesn't account for the total shift in volume that we saw. So there has to be something else. And that's really where that physics explanation comes in of the change in temperature and density of the air molecules around the flame. So as the flame starts burning down, there's less oxygen. And one additional thing that you can be thinking about, when there's lower oxygen amounts, we're actually gonna have a little more carbon monoxide. But what they found at Brunei was that the carbon monoxide was actually a pretty low amount that's produced. And another thing you might think about is the CO2 that's produced might get soaked into the water, and so there's less gas molecules, which rise the level even more. But the CO2 over the course of 30 to 40 minutes hardly soaks in, it's a very negligible amount. And so that doesn't shift the amount of water that comes in and affect the vapor pressure or pressure inside of our jar hardly at all. This is about to spill. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully you saw that there's essentially no bubbles when we did that. Now let me show you this one, because it's pretty interesting. What a match is light. That's pretty cool chemistry. So the flame as it's burning is producing convection currents that are hot and rise. So the CO2 and H2O that are getting produced in our combustion reaction are going upwards. But CO2 is more dense than air. So as it cools, it's going to sink because it's going to be more dense than the oxygen that's present. And so it'll displace the oxygen in that area. But the H2O that's rising, when it cools off, it's going to go from a gas state to a liquid state. And once it does that, it's gonna stop contributing to pressure. And the taller the candle for a shaped flask like this, the better the experiment works. This one always bubbles. There it goes. So cool. So the CO2 as it rises fills this area, but then it cools and the CO2 begins to fill from the bottom. And so it's kind of a race to see which is gonna put the candle out first, the CO2 that's sinking or the water that's rising. In this case, we saw the water put out the candle first. This one to me is way more interesting visually because we have both the bubbles that occur, because I think the bubbles, the candle heats the air that's inside the flask because the air inside the flask can't escape. Whereas when you have a container like this, it's moving into the less dense airspace and displacing the air inside here, whereas the air inside the flask is not getting displaced and it's heating when it covers the candle and as it heats, it thermally expands and that pushes the water and air down. So we have bubbles coming out. So we have a cool little effect there. Okay, let's try our variations now. Let's try our small flask now. We'll try to get all the water off the candle. Check this out. What do you think is going to happen now? All the time. It's really hard to actually get this one on the candle because as it goes down the neck here, it almost always puts out the candle. But let me see if I can get it. Why do you think this shaped container is always wanting to put out the candle when we cover it? Let me know. Think about all that we talked about.
Got it. See those bubbles escaping? Still burning. And then it shoots up. This one's really fun. The narrow volume of the neck makes the water seem to rise really, really fast. I don't think it's necessarily rising any faster, just the volume of water that's entering is going through a very small space, so it goes very quickly. Cool. Lastly, let's try our big flask. I've never actually done this one, so I'm curious what'll happen. Let me just make a quick note that I diagrammed out what I think's going on in this experiment a bit more clearly when I did it with isopropyl and steel wool. So if you haven't checked that out, you can see uh, pictorially kind of what I've been talking about a bit more. I wonder which is gonna light first, fingers or candle? It's getting pretty close. Ow! It was a tie. All right, here we go. So what do you think's gonna go on? We're gonna get bubbles? What's the CO2 gonna do? What's the H2O gonna do? Is it gonna get cloudy up in here? Is it not gonna get cloudy? What is the cloudiness? Whew, let's try. A lot of bubbles. Okay, no more bubbles now. Flame's still going. Oh, here comes the water. It stopped. Weird. Why did that happen? It's like going in phases. How weird. Explain to me. Try to figure this out. Why is the water going like up and down and stopping in phases? That's so trippy. Now it's getting foggy. Why is it getting foggy? Oh my gosh, this is so cool. There's so many things to think about. Oh, there it went, and now it's rising. Wow, that was extremely cool. I'm glad we got to see that together for the first time. That is really rad. There are so many things I'd like to think about with you for like 10 more minutes, but you're probably already gone, so I'm just talking to myself. Let me know what you think happened there, and I'll put another experiment here in linked or in the comments, and I'll also put those two papers that I kind of referenced as we went through. That was really fun. I can't wait to see you soon. Experiments, questions, curiosities, Blim Dog Science.